So, so far is it going all right? Thank you. Yes, Shekhar. No problem, no problem. Don't worry. I think this is unconference, so you know. You can do anything at any time during the conference. Welcome. Yeah, I just want to say one thing. Yes, yeah, if you could. Let everybody come in. <coughs> can somebody get everybody in, please? I'm here. <laughs> 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 Come on. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say that Alex McDowell is here. He's coming for an hour or two. Alex McDowell is probably the world's biggest production designer. He did everything from Fight Club to Charlie and the Chocolate Factory to Superman to almost every amazing movie. And he's top production designing now. He's, <clears throat> he's a supervising production designer for my next film. But he's now working with Intel. Who's here from Intel? Where are they? They were there yesterday, last night. Where are the Intel guys gone? So he's here, he's working with Intel. The Intel inside, you know. Yeah. Somewhere. He's working with, somebody just say Alex in that room, please, loudly. Alex. Oh, he's here, right? Yeah. Oh. So he's, um, he, he, he's now gone into something called world building. And world building, he's taken it beyond film. He's developed a little computer models of he builds worlds, not just for architecture, but even I think for chips, now he's going to world building. And he's working very closely with Intel on the future of chip design and how that relates to storytelling. So Alex said, sometime you've got to come up and tell us that. Just come in or we'll ask you, all right? So good to see you here. But here we go on a panel on, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a new reality. Alex is in front of us, we didn't see him and we are shouting. Yeah. That's a new reality. It's <laughs> so, um, I think this session uh, was supposed to be from 2.45 to 3.30. What we will do in light of the fact that we are running slightly short, we will perhaps reduce the sugar break so you don't have too much of sugar, but we will bring your cups inside and uh, I think continue our discussion so we don't shortcut what we want to discuss. Uh, so, so, so this whole theme is, is today's back office, tomorrow's front office. Is India the next technological superhero? How will the role of today's Hollywood superhero evolve? Has it already started to change? India has the world's largest pool of English speaking IT talent. Is today's back office employee tomorrow's storyteller? So the top ma major animation and VFX companies are owned by Indian companies. But is there a market for animation in India? So in this session, we'll explore the movement from human resources to human capital, the role of technology in storytelling, the landscape of technology in support services. And we have extremely good panel here. Uh, of course, I won't introduce and reintroduce and reintroduce Shekhar. But Namit Malhotra, he's executive chairman and group CEO of Prime Focus, most successful company. Mike Bundley, founder of Poets Road Inc. Ken Silverman and Kushal Ruya. Ken uh, is the head of North America, Sanam S4 Consulting, and Kushal is a creative director and co founder of Movix Media. So l I think uh, I would like uh, Namit to start with, or Shekhar, you want to? No, I'll, I'll introduce Namit, but Namit, yeah, I can tell you, about eight him. years ago, seven years ago, I did an interview with Time Magazine and said, how do you see the future of media and entertainment? And I said, you know what, when they make Spider-Man 6 and he takes his mask off, he'll be Chinese. And he'll be, he'll be swinging in Shanghai and not in New York. And I think we're heading towards that to be true. So I've known Namit for years. Namit used to work as a little kid in a garage doing, in, doing what? You were piloting videos or something? <laughs> and and uh, <laughs> he was. And today he owns one of the largest VFX, 2D to 3D companies in the world. He's a great deal maker. You should have been on the deal making panel. But the question to you is, in doing all this, you have about, what, 10,000 people working for you in India? 6,000. 6,000. And so what you do is, the reason you're successful is because when all the VFX companies here in the US are, are, are failing, you actually take back a lot of work to India where it's actually, you're developing talent there 
which is a little cheaper. So the question is, although you're doing back office work and developing cheaper talent, do you see a time when that talent is going to come out and be world beaters and write the new programs and make the new Pixar? Yeah, so I think uh, you know, it's a, it, it is a pertinent question, and I'm asked this all the time. In fact, uh, you know, as uh, go back a long time, you know, a time when I used to call him Shekhar Uncle, and mm. you know, <laughs> he, he missed he missed that part. You know, when he made the Mr. India film, I remember as a kid watching it and uh, clapping after the film, and that was one of the first instances of uh, Indian uh, films that was really breaking the boundaries in visual effects and uh, storytelling in a different realm. Uh, I think, you know, our development over the years has always been predicated on the basis that we are not a back office. I don't think in India, with the technological leap we took uh, between 95 and 2005, uh, we actually found ourselves at the cutting edge of technology at that point. And uh, the opportunity or the challenge I saw was that how can it be that we have uh, sort of a parity on technology have uh, systems and processes that are built up to match uh, Western standards, and uh, we are just lacking as a market domestically. And that's when the journey to take a real step forward into the Western uh, hemisphere uh, took off for prime focus. And over the years, actually, you know, and this, this is an interesting anecdote I'd, I'd say, you know, as part of trying to build a, you know, a globally diverse business, because I didn't believe in the concept of a back office, I always felt we had to have integrated operation between the West and the East so that they would operate as one. Filmmakers can't outshore filmmaking. You know, that's coming from a film family. I know that uh, the vision of a filmmaker is to maintain the continuity of that vision from the time they conceive it till it gets into the theaters. And uh, in order to do that, you have to provide a seamless interaction and a flawless execution of that vision. And, you know, as soon as I stepped into Hollywood, just like we had a big base in Bollywood and had been doing a whole bunch of movies, uh, I found that uh, in late 2007, early 2008, that uh, Hollywood was actually looking to push companies like us out, you know, who were trying to actually build a base in America, to say that we don't need services in America anymore, unless you're based in the UK or Canada, or one of these other international tax-friendly uh, uh, locations, you know, we're not open for business just to be working, uh, you know, in the US. I think the India story came much later, but uh, we had to actually quickly, in the time of the recession, move away from the US uh, stranglehold of physical infrastructure to open up uh, uh, facilities in London and Vancouver. And that uh, sort of you know, investment and transformation really started to build the template of what we are now running, where we've got now a truly a globally integrated uh, operation that works seven days a week, you know, 24 hours a day, depending on which part of the world or which time zone you're in, we are able to provide a seamless execution of uh, the creative delivery. And uh, that, I think, is uh, the model that we conceived, and it's taken us about seven years to get there, but uh, I'm glad it's a reality today. So the question is, why is it that the visual effects company and the animation companies here in the U.S. are in such trouble? Anybody wants to, to take on that? And why is that happening? Uh, partially, uh, partially, uh, Namit used the word uh, tax incentives, and um, more and more and more, I think the studios uh, have been saying, if if you can't do it for me in Canada or the UK, um, where we get the subsidies, we're not interested. And even I, I know some of the uh, other Indian companies would cut their prices to say, well, look, we're, we're parallel with what you would pay, including the subsidies, still not good enough. Uh, they want the subsidies. Um, on the uh, animation uh, front, if I can step back a little, I'd like to, uh, in a sense, jump off of something uh, that Namit said or, or what Prime Focus has done and give you a little bit of context about the animation industry in India and then how it relates to the U.S. Um, probably three weeks ago, I think it was announced, Namit, that Reliance Media Works is uh, going to be merged into Prime Focus and that Prime Focus will be the surviving company. What's uh, interesting and telling about this, uh, Reliance and the Tata Group are the two biggest companies in India, bar, bar none. They're the two biggest. 
uh, both of them going back to, uh, particularly uh, Tata probably going back to about 99, 2000, and Reliance uh, some years later, uh, decided that the uh, entertainment business, making movies, doing animation for American movies and American television series, is a great business. We ought to be in that business. Why should little guys have that business? We, these big companies, are going to step in with all of our power and we're going to control it. And both of those companies, the two biggest in India, Tata and Reliance, have essentially, um, I'm trying to find another word besides failed, but they failed. Um, they're, uh, one of the things, and we were talking about this yesterday on a call, uh, one of the things that has made Prime Focus so successful, and in the animation space there's uh, Prana, is, is probably among the most successful uh, animation companies. There's another company called DQ. You have uh, visionary founders with, with passion and commitment to doing the business, to the creative process, to making films, to working with creative people, and uh, recognize and appreciate the creative process. Both Tata and uh, Reliance, as well as uh, my, my first major Indian client in bringing them to the U.S., goes back uh, almost 17 years ago, a company called Pentamedia. Um, their perceptions were that uh, uh, in Indian engineers are the answers to everything. Uh, if you're going to start an animation company, take your Indian engineers, teach them how to draw, and you've got animators. Yeah, because they know something called Jugar. Jugar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Means yeah. How to Quick put fix. a nut and bolt together in ways that nobody else in the world knows. Um, obviously, the, the, the real way to do it is you teach an artist how to use a computer. So both of those companies had corporate uh, administrative bureaucratic types running their operations, Tata and Reliance, and did not have visionary, passionate filmmakers or creators. And um, both of them failed ultimately to penetrate uh, the, the market. Uh, so if somebody else would, why did Rhythm and Hughes fail? Rhythm and Hughes was one of, run by a very, very, very passionate filmmaker, if you like. They did all the visual effects for Life of Pi. And I know, Namit, that you at one time were considering buying Rhythm and Hughes, which was going bankrupt. You and I talked about it. Ultimately, Prana, which is another Indian company, they bought it. Uh, why are these companies failing? Why does a company that does, has on one level, go and take an Oscar for Life of Pi, and then the next day declare bankruptcy? I think, uh, well, sure, I mean, we, we actually just recently hired Prana and uh, R&H uh, for, uh, we're producing a project for Marvel that required three hours of 3D animation. And we had, we looked at uh, animation houses all around the world. We ended up doing sort of a, a crossover between doing all the previs here in LA with Third Floor and then hiring Prana and RNH for uh, the actual production animation. I, I think one of the biggest things, having a lot of friends in the VFX and uh, animation business, is that in in the U.S., you know, we, you know, we we sort of work with a very migratory work structure. So people, artists, they you know, they float in. Um, you know, they, they basically get paid, uh, you know, uh, based on their day rates, and then they leave. And it's, you know, it, it fluctuates very heavily where we might have the same artist that works for multiple VFX companies and on the same projects. So same thing with, uh, with the Marvel projects. We end up hiring people um, that work for one VFX company, and then as soon as they go to another project, we just pull them in and continue working. And it's been great to keep costs down because you can say, okay, this is how much I need. I'm going to hire these artists for this amount of time, and then they go. The problem is they get paid you know, very handsomely in the U.S., and they, they know that they're going to take off because they want to constantly be looking for new places to work. And when you look at a company like, uh, like what uh, um, Prime, or Prime Focus has been able to do and what Prawn is able to do is you have a large workforce, so there's a little bit of confidence in the idea that you know, it's going to go for a long term. And if you have, I mean, obviously, when you look at India and how the workforce is structured there, um, it, the concept of sort of getting hired for only a short amount of time and then leaving um, is, you know, is not the same. I mean, people are expecting so in India to have a minimum that, of a six-month contract. Is that true? Do you well, find that 
people stay longer at prime focus in India than they will here? I think uh, that's also to do with, uh, again, I, I wouldn't say that the industry in India is healthier than the industry over here. I think there's, a, there's enough examples of companies that have come and gone back in India as well. My competitors from five years ago don't exist today in the Bollywood domestic market. So there is something to be said about, you know, the industry is fraught with this fundamental issue of you're in a project-centric business mm -hmm. that that is mapped by a company like us, you know, or other companies that have a workforce of, you know, people who are there as permanent fixed employees. And that's the balancing act that's hard. Now, to your question earlier, I think, uh, you know, it's not just visual effects. If you think about it, visual effects companies are still I would say overstate their existence in California much beyond production has. You know, you can't name a single film that's in the top 10, top 20 category in any year over the last five years that has been filmed in California. So all the production itself has been moved away. The studios have made a conscious decision to keep their own stages empty, not hire some of the best crews in, in Los Angeles and move their productions into foreign locations because of the cost of production. Yep. Visual effects is a part of the production cost, and companies that were not able to adapt to that s scenario have found themselves, uh, you know, incredibly challenged. And that's something, like I said, you know, we encountered that in early 2008, where, uh, you know, we were 300 people in LA. We are down to about 15 because we can't uh, sustain the business here. The, st the studios give you no credit for having a huge infrastructure in this part of the world. And that is the un unfortunate, but the factual reality of what, which is why we see companies in Canada or the UK are actually healthier than companies in the US, particularly. And India is still further ways away. You know, I don't think there's enough that India or China has done to really make a dent Industry. in the Hollywood market as yet. You know, uh, I think that's where I think America's lost more uh, movies to professionals in Australia, the UK, and Canada in the last 10 years than it has to China or India. For sure. What would yeah. you think? Oh, I totally agree with that. I mean, uh, because of the VFX industry, the costs and the quality and the technology, the uh, barrier to enter has reduced considerably. And in India, where there is such a huge task force available, and they're passionate, and they want to learn new things, and animation is something that India has honestly been catching up to, you know, it's not something that was originated in India. So we took some time getting there, but we are there now and there is an immense desire. And so when people are looking to, uh, you know, put work out, India is one of the top candidates to do that. And uh, because of the language and understanding and the understanding of cinema and film, and I think it's just a very natural progression that it goes to India. and. Uh, it's just a matter of time before India gets more, uh, starts doing more IP and creating content, not just doing outsourcing work, but actually creating content which the world can see and appreciate and, and holds that high benchmark of international animation. That's something we are missing so far in comes to original IP, but yeah. So why has India not created IP in, in, in animation? Uh, I think predominantly it is uh, the- Because it's not just the film, it's the software. I mean, Pixar has its own software. Disney has their own software. We have the largest pool of IT professionals in India. Why right. have we not yet created a software that has is uh, there's an IP in I, India? Uh, I think more than software. I like you said, we have we have so many intelligent people, and why haven't we done that yet? I think because uh, Prana has. Sorry? Yeah, Prana actually has. No, I yeah. mean in, in terms of creating IP based. Sorry, on so software. Prana has created in India or created it here? Well, that's a good question. They, they actually migrated a lot of the Rhythm and Use software over. Who to wrote be it used. here? Yeah. And okay, so that f comes back to my fundamental question here: is that is that about to happen? Are because we have such large backs, back office people who are migrating to here, are the Indian companies or the Chinese companies are going to take over the world market in terms of animation so, and so VFX? So, Shaker, I have a slightly different take on. Yeah. You know, it's not India or China. I think, I think we all talk about these devices. You know. Designed in California, assembled in China. You know, that's uh, Apple for you. You know, tell Apple to move its entire manufacturing base back into America, and it won't be the company it is. So I think, and China, with due respect, cannot do what Apple does. I think we just have to agree that there are complementing strengths, and I think our model at Prime Focus was very clearly laid out on the premise that uh, 
we have to bring the best of the world together. This is not an India only or a China only prerogative. You know, we have to collaborate. Innovation and technological, uh, you know, technology brings it together, but we have to provide people, you know, the understanding and the sensibilities ultimately, because ultimately, you know, Hollywood is Hollywood because it, it communicates to the world. India and China are still, I think, figuring out their own markets, you know, and trying to, India particularly, I think Bollywood movies don't run, I think Harry Potter does more business than a Bollywood movie does in the south of India, and perhaps vice versa, so I think there are diversity of culture, discrepancies that people have all talked about. I think we have to really build uh, a sense of collaborative uh, connect. And you know, I, I, I say this in a sort of a rudimentary example because uh, it's odd that you know, we are in the entertainment industry and we are sort of trailing behind other industries, but just to give you a sense, you know, my grandfather was a cinematographer in the 1950s who collaborated with Ernest Hello, who shot Gone with the Wind to bring the first color film to India called Jhansi Kirani in the 1950s. And there seems to be a complete shutdown till I think you actually reopened those doors that you can have people working on both sides of the world, you know, opening those doors. And I think that's really been uh, an unfortunate but real uh, scenario. And I think that's something that we have to do better at in the entertainment industry. We have to learn how to really collaborate across these uh, continents and cultures. Yes. I, I think talking about uh, animation, uh, we have to separate theatrical feature animation and television animation. Uh, the bulk of theatrical feature animation is still done in this country. Pixar mm -hmm. does it all here. They won't move it out. Uh, DreamWorks is starting to do a little bit uh, overseas, but it's mostly here. Uh, television animation, however, uh, particularly CGI animation, uh, India really came into its own doing uh, work for hire CGI animation. Uh, uh, one company, as an example, I mentioned DQ earlier, they started doing uh, episodic uh, CGI animation, particularly for a guy named Mike Young, who's, who's kind of a pioneer in bringing work to India. Uh, Mike then, rather than a, a pure fee-based, said, let's do a co-production model. Uh, if it's 100000 an episode, I'll pay you fifty, and 50000 you'll have skin in the game and you'll kind of ride on the success of it. DQ is now a publicly traded uh, company in India doing its own IP, television IP. They probably have, I'm guessing, several dozen co-productions, and I read uh, two days ago uh, Viacom in India has uh, done a licensing deal with DQ to take all of the merchandising on for Jungle Book, which is, I mean, it's a Kipling uh, original piece of property, but it's a DQ and intellectual property for uh, television animation, and it's only the second time that Viacom has taken on a uh, I IP that it doesn't own. Uh, so again, television and film are, are separate. Yeah. But I also think it's, it's just part of the natural you know, global progression. I mean, in Japan, uh, obviously in the 80s, yeah, TV animation hasn't been done in the US for coming on 30 years now, but um, Japan used to be the epicenter, and because from a workforce standpoint, from a technology standpoint, they could produce it. Um, but then as they got too expensive, the work moved to Korea, and Japan started switching into you know, producing more IP for ingestion into the US. Korea then also started to, um, you know, to do original IP. I, I was there uh, doing a movie um, years ago, and at the time, you know, we were being shopped a bunch of IP from Korea to come into the U.S. And uh, while we were there, we got pitched five different TV series, all of which were based around kimchi. And there was, you know, it, it, there was a cultural misunderstanding because most Americans obviously had zero understanding of what kimchi was, let alone want to watch superheroes that are named after kimchi ingredients. And you know, so it was a, you know, then, then Korea got too expensive and the work moves to India. So I think as, you know, as India grows and, um, and continues, you know, with Prana and with um, Prime Focus and with a bunch of other companies, you run the risk that India at some point um, will mature to the point of becoming too expensive and Malaysia will take over from a, a workforce standpoint. Yeah. And hopefully India's IP at that point will start to trickle, you know, more into the U.S. culture. It's uh, also worth noting, speaking of IP, that uh, there have been a number of Indian 
uh, produced and distributed uh, animated theatrical features. Uh, unfortunately, none of them have done uh, especially well, and none of them have gone global. One of them uh, was a Disney Yash Raj co-production, Roadside yeah. Romeo. Um, and I mean, at some point, perhaps on the panel, you, you wanted to get into a discussion of uh, is there a market for Indian IP uh, animation in India, theatrical? Okay, so two questions here, so, and I'm going to open it up to the audience. One of the things that why we have VFX and animation is such an interesting question is the IT business in India, for example, and in China, you know, we grew and we grew and we grew and became, but we stayed for a long time back office. We were support systems to the world, whether it was uh, any kind of business, to Intel we were a support system, to Cisco we were a support system, to everybody we were a support system. Visual effects and people like Namit were the first ones to come out of being a support system to come out and buy some of the major companies, and China of course is doing it. But certainly Namit, you and Prana, for example, are the prime examples of people who started by support systems and then came out and you now are the leading VFX and company in the world. Um, what, that's one question. How did that happen? What decision did you make? I mean, I know it's a series of chances and decisions. What's the fundamental thing you said to yourself? Because you lived in India, you came from an Indian Bollywood family, and you suddenly one day made this decision. What was that? I think, you know, probably I was too young at that point. I'd, I'd, <laughs> I'd, I'd that's the decision, I'd <laughs> stay young. I think, uh, no, I think, Clearly, you know, we did really well back in India, and I think uh, we did better than we ever thought we would. So after we got to a certain place, you know, we said we won the national, we were playing at the national levels, let's see if we can get the World Cup. And, uh, and that was a big motivation to see, you know, to try and see if we could really help bridge that gap. Again, IT companies in India had proven that that model was going to work. I think filmmakers like you, my grandfather, other people had proven that it can work. So I think, uh, I just sort of saw that as an opportunity for myself and said, uh, you know, if, if you're going to do it, this is the time and let's see, you know, what it takes to make it happen. And we raised a bunch of money and said, let's put our best foot forward and uh, go for the ride. Yeah, how many people told you you're crazy? Everybody. <laughs> 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 Including my father. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I know that. Every time I do something, everybody says you're crazy, then I know I have to do it. That means it makes sense. Um, so the other question that I have, this is, is, you know, one of the things that Japan did, we talk about animation in India, we talked about yesterday, Jeffrey, we talked about animation in China. Why is it the Chinese, why Kung Fu Panda will succeed and the Chinese animation won't? What, what is it? What is it about us that Finding Nemo will succeed and then Indian animation won't? Uh, Jeffrey. Sorry. Sorry, I was. Well, partly, well, it sounds like a joke, <laughs> but the success of Kung Fu Panda is because it's made in America. Okay. And I think I forgot who's from uh, Oriental Junior Works said in one of the summit, which I knew before that was, if you start a Kung Fu Panda one, we're talking about one, uh, uh, as uh, animation co-produced with China, probably you won't get past. Okay. Yeah, you'll be banned because there's no because uh, 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 at least um, to some uh, Chinese uh, uh, officials, animation is still are for kids, so it's educational, and it's very problematic that you have the father of a panda which is not a panda. Okay. How do you explain to your kids? Okay, this is bad education, um, and so that's why it. it but of course, after the first success, and we, we, we all the Chinese say, why Kung Fu Panda is not made by the Chinese? Yeah, because yeah, Kung Fu and Panda are Chinese. Yeah, yeah they're both <laughs> Chinese, that's what I wondered. But you know what the Japanese did was, is, is there a problem because the Japanese developed anime, which is a far cheaper form of animation and was m highly styled much more towards the Japanese taste. Um, India's not developed, although we have such a huge uh, uh, such a huge interest in, and talent in art and drawing with our own kind of art. Yet when we go to animation, we do Me Too animation. We do Me Too like what Disney does or was, oh, maybe what Pixar does. We can't do that. But let's try and do what Disney does. Why has India not developed its own animation, I, its own style? 
If I may, I mean, um, I think that one of the main problems is there is that when we started into animation, our foot in the door was through service work. So people were concentrated on that for the longest time. And when we thought of, okay, let's start making our own content, uh, we wanted to jump the gun. We didn't pay our dues. We didn't learn the tools of the trade enough. We didn't, we didn't develop our skills in animation. We didn't learn to be animation storytellers. And that is a price for which we are still paying today because our products are, the pr uh, content we create is not very well thought out. We haven't, investors don't invest so much time and energy in pre-production because they want to get their film made and get it out and on whatever money they want, uh, they've invested back. So we need to spend a little more time in development. That's one of the root causes why we haven't really developed any IP which works internationally in animation. And secondly, uh, I think we are also wanting to create for the Indian market, and that is a debate in itself where Indian, animation has not been successful in India. And uh, because again and again, the Indian audiences vote with their rupees and you know we don't get that amazing box office when it comes to Indian animation. In 2012, we had like five movies coming out, 2D, 3D, CG, mythology based, non-mythology based, and none of them had really exceptional box office to talk about. You know, So I mean, that is something to think about, about the demand for animation in India too. Does it exist and should we create so for them? Sorry. Yeah, I think uh, you know I have an interesting uh, observation, you know, on uh, on Indian animation. You know, just to what you said again, it's one of those classic uh, examples that uh, you know the first film that actually did some business was Hanuman because it connected sensibility-wise. Forget about the fact that uh, creatively it could have been better or worse, didn't matter. It did well, and then there's a television network, you know, with, that we've been supplying animation work to for the last five years. It's not animation work we'd put on our showreel, but it's called 9XM Music. And it's been, uh, it was the first test that these guys did where uh, they introduced CGI characters and Indian characters that would act as VJs and you know, dance and entertain the audiences and created something very interesting. Now, what's working there is the content. It's not for me to sit here and say animation quality, you know, we do, work for Lego on the animation side, and we know that that's creatively or qualitatively, visually significantly superior, but to the Indian uh, audience, the 9XM characters are much more in line with the sensibilities of what works, and that, they were actually contemplating turning that into a feature, just making those, taking those characters and turning it into a feature. So I think the, the seeds are being you know, laid for, uh, you know, animation to evolve, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the change in the consumption patterns with the newer generation on the, on the rise is going to create uh, that opportunity for Indian animation projects or the big visual effects projects that are now all becoming more and more uh, commonplace for the Indian market. Um, I'd like to add something there. Um, when I was advising uh, Tata, uh, I mentioned we did a joint uh, venture, uh, Yash Raj and Disney co-produced uh, Roadside Romeo, which uh, Tata Alexi did the execution for. Uh, and it had major uh, Bollywood stars doing the voiceovers. Uh, in the early run on the film, uh, and it was, in many respects, it was very well done. Big uh, Bollywood dance musical numbers. It was, it really pushed the envelope in terms of trying to be an Indian and not mythology, but uh, Indian entertainment. Uh, people were showing up at the box office and realizing that uh, they were not going to see these actors on the screen live, but they were only the voices. They wanted their money back. Uh, when they realized that it was uh, 85 minutes running time as opposed to three hours running time, that's not a value proposition. I want my money back. <laughs> so uh, I, I think that um, it was, uh, on an earlier panel, they talked about the difference between Hollywood and Bollywood. The movie-going experience for the largest bulk of the Indian audience and the movie-going experience for people in the U.S. being willing to pay regular theatrical prices for a 85, 90 minute animated film, it's just different and you, you gotta deal with that too. So people like to go to the theaters and have nice air condition and sleep there as well. So don't forget yeah. one more purpose. No, no, I remember, I remember as a kid <laughs> going to the theater and if it was like a three hour film, we all cheered and clapped. Three, three and a half hours, 
you know, it's, you have three and a half hours to try and hold your girlfriend's hand. Yeah. <laughs> so, and it's all air conditioned. Like, what could be better? Yeah. Yep. So, and then if it was just like two hours, we booed. <laughs> so like, what the hell? We're not getting our money's worth. I, I think Kung Fu Panda is a great example because I think you know, a lot of the Chinese companies that we've met with have consistently said um, what Jeffrey said, which is why was Kung Fu Panda made in the U.S.? And I think it, you know, it, it's not going to be long before um, the U.S. animation studios, in, in an attempt to try to capitalize on the, just the sheer audience in India, produces something um, that is Indian culture-based that then becomes a worldwide success. And um, in, in, in India, we're going to end up hearing that sort of that cultural rally cry of why did this get produced outside of India? And hopefully at that point, uh, a lot of self-reflection and an artist such as yourself coming out that becomes uh, sort of a, the, the crossover that's needed. I think DreamWorks is doing uh, yeah. Yeah, they are. that. Yeah. They called it mm -hmm. the monkeys of Bollywood yep. for a long time till they realized that wasn't the right <laughs> to have, and they changed the title. It's actually uh, a version of the Ramayana they're doing. So they've gone back to mythology. Yeah. Right? yeah. There was, if I could, there was one other point based on something you said, uh, Shaker, that's worth clarifying. At the beginning of the uh, most recent uh, evolution of the uh, Indian animation uh, industry beginning in the 90s, um, many of the early animation companies were software companies who figured we can do all of the software yeah. programming now, we'll, we'll be an animation company. What, what they, among other things, what they failed to realize, in doing software, there's one answer, there's a right answer. It, it's either right or it's wrong, it works or it doesn't. When doing animation, it's taste, it's I think this is a pretty bunny rabbit. No, I'm the client. I think this is a pretty bunny rabbit. And that uh, sensibility in terms of judgment, who, whose opinion matters? Well, the client's opinion uh, is what matters. So the early software companies doing animation had a very hard time dealing with the fact, well, you wanted a bunny. I gave you a bunny. What's wrong with that? Uh, which is not mm -hmm. software. Yeah. No, okay. Should we start on conference now? Yeah. Questions? Uh, yes. David, uh, sir, so I think your mic is not working. Okay. No, there must be somewhere. Uh, everybody wants to listen to you. Hold on. Uh, yeah. Just shout, David. Um, I, I want to ask a question about post for equity. It's something that's happening here in the United States where service providers are actually lending post cash flowing so that they can take an equity position on a film. It's another way to establish the capital stacks to financing projects. People are doing it here in the United States, both in terms of television, they're doing it here in the United States in terms of uh, motion picture financing and production. The question that I have really is for the, for the panel, and uh, Namit, I'm not sure if you have a specific point of view on this, but the, context, the, the concept of post for equity uh, in an industry like Bollywood, is that something that you see a future for? Is that something that you yourself would get behind and potentially lend post for projects, securing an equity position on those projects? Yeah, we, in, in we've lost money on a couple of them already. On yeah. post? <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. It, but in, in, in Bollywood? Yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter whether you're Bollywood or Hollywood. It's the same. Mm -hmm. We've experienced it on both sides of the world. But, uh, you know, specifically, I would say that uh, as the structure of the deals are becoming more and more uh, clearer as you go along and you know, it's all whether it's in hollywood or in bollywood i think uh, who you do that business with is going to be critical uh, more than whether uh, a particular film is the right one or not you know that no one knows but uh, it's about knowing that when you take that risk you've got uh, credibility coming out of uh, you can recover your money if the film actually does well i think that's a that's a bigger question on both sides of the world, I would say, whether it's Hollywood or Bollywood, then, uh, and there is openness, I'm sure, uh, for the right project and for the right opportunity, I think that uh, will be there uh, for companies to to push the envelope and raise the bar. We actually did that for the Marvel project right now. So, uh, and that was actually a key factor in uh, some of the conversations we were having with various animation studios. Thank you. I have you a have question, a can I ask one question? I have to be nice to Namit. His company is doing all the visual effects of my film. <laughs> so I'm being nice to say. One, I've, this one question which affects a lot of people is a general question, not just animation. 
If you're running a service company as successfully as you are, you're employing six to 7,000 people, because you and I keep talking about that you want to make films, you want to create IP. Are you riding the tiger in servicing your clients so much on a day-to-day -day basis that you just don't have the time to sit back and do R&D to create your own IP and your own movie? Is that a, a, that, is that a, I've seen this problem elsewhere. Do you have the same I problem? Think, uh, I think it's, I, the way I've obviously, because I come from fortunately an experience of understanding both sides of the table, the services business is run much like uh, any other business you know, that needs to really, whether you're a law firm or whether you're a, an accounting firm, you've got, a, you've got hundreds of people, thousands of people on the bench, you've got to be able to find them, work and keep them going. Uh, the film production side, or the creative creation uh, side, I think needs to deploy a certain different uh, skill set. Mm -hmm. And uh, while there is a good marriage to be had between the two sides, I think uh, trying to use one as the, uh, as the lever for the other, I think is wrong as long as you can distinctively understand what risk profile you're playing with. You know, the film production has got a different risk profile, it has a different reward profile. Similarly, the services business should be run like a traditional business does. And I think uh, we obviously see ourselves extending into the other side as a next step, but uh, with a very clear view that that's a separate business on its own. You can't just cross leverage what you have. All right. Because that's also a danger. Okay. Yes, yeah. lots of questions. Mm -hmm. We have... Uh, Nish, let's have quick questions. Uh, uh, okay, yes. I understand nobody wants bio break because there was unstructured... Yeah. Unbio, whatever you yeah, call it. Let's go. So, quick question. Um, in talking about the creative aspect of things, and especially that kind of. Can you introduce yourself? My name is Harish Rao. And to talk about the actual creative aspect of things and kind of this kind of cultural gap, you know, speaking about this, this topic, there was a movie that came out in 1991. And I think the late Krishna Shah tried to actually get this back out again. Um, it was a joint collaboration between an Indian company and a Japanese company. It was an Indian Japanese animated Ramayana. In fact, if you can actually go on YouTube, you'll actually see it. Probably one of the best renditions of the Ramayana, but for whatever reason, it didn't actually kind of come out and make it out to the, the larger mainstream. I guess the question that I have for the panelists is that in the gaming space where I'm kind of, you know, all doing a lot of my work, I come across this kind of situation all, all the time whereby you have clients that have a difficulty communicating with Indian animators, and Indian talent, and there's a cultural gap that exists. Um, and that cultural gap is, even though we speak English, it doesn't mean that it translates across the pond, as it were. So like the English that we, and the cultural references that we have here in America, or let's say in Europe, are not the same cultural references that we have in India. So I guess my question is, um, what do you see as the future in terms of Indian content? How do you employ people that actually live in this country that are, say, of Indian origin or Chinese origin, uh, or in Europe? and actually start to connect that to start to tell stories in a unique way or in a different way? Uh, uh, in a small way, we are trying to do that at MoveX because I've uh, studied, worked in Canada and in India at AC Amartya Srikatha Animation. I was leading that for five years. So uh, what I'm doing at MoveX is something based on that because I understand the language and like you talked about, not just the, literally the language, it is how people communicate, what references do they use, like how an American director would talk about, you know, this is the shot I want and this is, this is what I'm looking for, this is the color, have you seen that movie, that's the reference point. Those are the things on a day-to-day -day basis that matter, you know. So we need to have those kind of people who, are, who know culturally in and out each other's references. So we're trying to create that bridge and make it a universal, literally a universal platform. So you can have, you speak the same creative language, not just the language to articulate, and you speak the same creative language. So it has to be people who understand both sides. I think that missing link has to be there. Because there is talent on both sides, definitely. There is no debate over there. You There's know? Uh, w one more uh, answer to your question, Harish. Uh, up until 1991, India had one television channel. Today, I think it's over a thousand. So all of the animators in India who are now working uh, have essentially grown up watching Cartoon Network, watching Nickelodeon, watching Disney Channel. So there are thousands and thousands and thousands of animators who now do have an American sensibility in terms of, you know, visually timing of jokes and so on. I have a question. 
uh, here yep. in the corner. Me, quick. Um, we, uh, India has produced very good animation, right? Uh, but if you look at Indian market, the biggest animation story, if you consider as a successful, is a th Chota Bhim. It's such a lousy quality in terms of uh, uh, animation. Why is that? And it's so successful. Every kid in India talks about Chota Bhim and there's all kinds of stuff. Why is that? Uh, I think, sorry. Just story. Please, go ahead. I think, uh, see, as I said earlier, the, that storytelling always overpowers uh, technology or the finesse. I think if, if you get characters that people connect with and the emotion is right, the humor and the sensibility is in place, it just, that's always going to be the f most important thing. You know, you see that in Hollywood all the time, you know, big extravagant movies that look fantastic don't make a mark at the box office if the stories aren't, you know, something you can connect with or the characters aren't someone's uh, people you can relate with. And I think that's always going to be the de facto standard of uh, the business we're in. That that's always going to override everything else at the end of the day. And yeah, just look at South Park. Yeah, and right, also exactly. I think in India we don't uh, hold ourselves to higher standard when it comes to animation because we think it's for children. Chalta hai, bachche ke liye. It's, it's, for, it's for a child. No, let's not bother with it. Let's not fuss over it. That's the kind of an attitude for in animation in India. So we don't really exact it to the level where we think, okay, we can be proud of it or we can show it internationally. Though it, it's good enough and our kids love it. And I know, you know, like, uh, you know, Namit also said, they relate to it and it works for them. And that's, and that's good enough for us. So th that's where it stops, unfortunately. I think it's also evolutionary. It's not like Hollywood always had the best quality and everything. You know, if you go yeah. back and watch, you know, movies, uh, even the Star Wars movies that were done 15, 20 years ago, okay. from a visual effects standpoint, they look pretty amateurish today relative to what is possible. And so it's always an evolution. It's always a, an evolving art. And, uh, you know, the work we do sometimes is outdated by the time it's in the theaters. We did Gravity, you know, which is a big technological marvel. It uh, released a year after we had done it. So for us, it was already obsolete by the time it hit the screens. And that's just the nature of what we, you know, what, what happens in the technology and creative world. Okay. We've run out of time, folks. So we have to stop here, I'm afraid. Sorry, Namit. I know you guys have so much more to say. Sure. But there's a coffee break. But, but one before thing everybody goes. If uh, people like, uh, should we have them go out quickly? So I'm going to offer you something. Is, is Alex still here? Alex? Yeah. Oh. Alex has so much to say because Alex is developing the new models of how to build worlds for cinema and outside cinema. He's working on new models. So those of you that want to go out for coffee because, yes, we promised coffee. And there I'm just going to ask Alex to come off and in that 10, 15 minutes because he has, I know he has to leave. He's going to a conference at Wired where he's the keynote speaker. So Alex, if you would come up. Sit with me here. Those that want to go for coffee can go for coffee. But I would really recommend listening to Alex because I've sat many hours with him. And he has so much to say about what he's doing. And yeah, we Welcome. can. Yeah. Um, yeah. You'll have to stand, I think. Yeah, Alex. I can. Yeah, okay. yeah I'll, I'll ask you a question. You stand. OK. So Alex, um, two questions we want to ask you. One, what is world building? And how do you redefine? Because you having become the world's biggest production designer ever, doing films like, you know, you did Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, right from Fight Club to Superman to Minority Report, and you did all of those, and you said, I'm not doing cinema anymore, right? And you're not gonna do films anymore, but you're gonna go into something called world building. And what is world building to you? How do you take that, what you have learned in other, in film outside, and tell us a little bit about what you're doing with Intel and how an mm, Intel okay. and you are working together. Okay. Well, thank you. Sorry, I'm, I'm barging in here. Um, I think, first of all, just to respond to one thing on the panel, I disagree that the client chooses the bunny. I think that the creative chooses the bunny. Our job is to be paid to advise the client, and I think that's true of the process here that we're talking about. Like the the amazing visual effects industry, the market, the film industry at, at, at large is a, a relationship between the creative and the client that is all about getting the story to the front. The story drives that. And I think the creators are in control of the bunny, you know, of, of the story itself. Uh, having said that, um, 
I didn't really give up production design to do world building. World building came directly out of production design. Um, on Minority Report, I started a film that had no script. And we had a year almost of time where we had to develop a world within which the script could evolve. And that coincided with this dramatic drop in the price, in the, in the price of computation. So what we found was that we had the tools to create an immersive environment within which all of the creators could step in, you know, the director, the producers, the, the, the writer, um, and, and engage in a story world from which they could extract the narrative itself. So that in, in the case of Minority Report, what we discovered was that sequences and whole po portions of the film evolved out of the exploration of the world space itself. And that world space was put together with the logic of that particular film, Washington DC 2050, the future. But the, there was a really different relationship between, um, between, for example, the writing process, the script itself, and the design and the front end process involving everybody. So I think that I encourage everybody to, um, to uh, set aside the 20th century anachronism of linear production, of pre-production or development, pre-production, production and post-production. Think about the process that we work in now as one that is completely holistic. Uh, that in the first day of production, of, of development actually, we are already in post. But we are also at the, f at the front end. So we're developing, by th the, my, my sort of definition of world building would be that we're creating this immersive, interactive space that is essentially the stage of the future. It's the space in which we collaborate and work together. Um, it's no longer such a solitary uh, space. It's not really the writer with the typewriter with 120 stacks of white paper, you know, with writing on them. I think it's the, uh, all of those things moving together. And so we talk about a nonlinear production process in lockstep with world building because it's about a new kind of collaboration. And where this really pays off, and I think we all understand this clearly, is that we're moving into a media space that uh, is cross-platform, you know, cross-media, multimedia. If you're writing for virtual reality, if you're developing stories for virtual reality, you, are, you have no frame. The camera is the audience's eyes. It's not interaction in, the fi in, the, in, a, in a game sense. It's not cinematic in a film sense, but it is absolutely cinematic in a story sense. But you have to start developing completely new muscles to write for the, the new media within which we're working. And the, the linear narrative, the linear process, does not really apply when you're doing a multi-platform, multi-media output of story, multiple stories coming out of a single space. So I guess that's where I've got to right now. And that's what I'm teaching here. I mean, I'm, I'm enormously privileged to be teaching at School of Cinematic Arts um, and teaching world building here. And that's ultimately why I stopped making film is I can't teach and be available to go to India even okay. <laughs> at the drop of a hat. Okay, and something you're doing with Intel, what is it doing? We've, a project we've been doing with Intel, now we're moving into our third year, a funded research project in my lab, the World Building Media Lab. Uh, it's called Leviathan. Uh, it's from a young adult story um, by a, a man called Scott Westerfeld, who's a New York bestseller, New York Times bestseller. Um, and it involves a steampunk sort of turn of the century, 1895 story about a whale that flies. It's a giant whale airship, essentially, carrying a payload of, of people um, and strange fabricated creatures. So it's a very parallel universe. The motive for Intel is to look at the future of narrative. Uh, ultimately, the motive for Intel is to see how deeply we can test their computation. This is, a, this is such a massively complicated story space that there are no processes that can actually handle it right now, and Intel loves that. If we say it's impossible to compute, then, uh, then that sort of kicks uh, machinery in motion to start solving that problem. So that's actually the project we're doing with them. Alex, thanks, because really I wanted to, because a lot of the questions that have come up is we talked in the first session about technology and content going together, and everybody said, well, technology is different. Here is a man who's a production designer, is working with Intel, telling a story, and pushing the limits for Intel and saying, how can you design a chip that actually can tell this story, right? 
Thank you. Any questions? Before Michael has to really go, so if there's any question, you have one chance to sit with, sit with Alex, sorry. Uh, that lady. Yeah. Uh, that yes. Okay. Can you just uh, use the microphone? I'm Everett Cowings with the Adorning, and we have two projects that creates its own world. And from an investor standpoint, where do you start and with the actual rollout of the project? Is it through the internet? Is it through television? Is it through film? But they all kind of combine and go together. So it's, that's the challenge that some of the investors are having uh, yeah. with respects to the independent production of this. But we all know that this is kind of where media is going. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, because I'm at the front end, my answer perhaps might be more about where do you start selling the project in the f at the beginning. And I think that the tools that we have available to us now are the tools, that, as Shaker has seen, where you put the potential audience, the potential client, inside the world from the very beginning. And you actually give them the experience of, of developing the world as a collaborator. Um, so. I, I think, I mean, I think we start now, when we're thinking, especially in the lab and with the student projects, we don't think about what platform the story is going towards. We think about developing the story first and then see what's the most viable platform to put it out on. So uh, in the case of Leviathan, we're looking at what we're calling a braided narrative where it's a TV-like environment where there might be 30 or 40 stories going on simultaneously in the same space. Um, but the audience gets to move around in that time space um, container of the whale. Um, and so in that case, the story space and the story possibilities are pushing towards a new kind of platform in that case. You know, what essentially it's a platform for VR. But I think that the process itself opens the, the, the lid, you know, op opens the, um, the process up to uh, the investor. Um, and I think that you can sort of collaborate on what is the best, the best uh, media space to push it out to. Um, a lot of what we're finding as we develop worlds is that uh, you, it's kind of all the above is true as well, which is that you could say, this looks like a great film project, but we have all of these assets developed that allow it to push into web space or push into another space as well. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, I think there was a question. There was a question, yes. I think it has to hey, be the last question because I know Alex needs to leave. So. Sure, Alex. My question, um, I come from the gaming world and I've been in virtual reality since 98. Um, given Oculus's uh, merger with Facebook or acquisition by Facebook, are you looking at pushing these worlds into the Oculus or VR world? Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, I think for myself, I'm pretty media platform agnostic. I think that all of these new kind of spaces like the Oculus Rift are really interesting. I think they're mostly interesting to me because they force us to think differently about the language of cinema or the language of storytelling and how you do that. But absolutely right now we are doing most of our projects have some attention being paid to VR. And, and you know, how does the home experience change? The big, the big awakening of the Facebook acquisition of Oculus Rift is suddenly there's going to be, you know, 200 million units in the home. And so you've got to pay attention to that now. I mean, VR, I used my first VR for Lawnmower Man in 1990, around that time. Um, and, uh, but it, they were $20,000 objects that you couldn't really use. Now, now they're going to be ubiquitous, as ubiquitous as a cell phone, essentially. Um, what we're looking at is how much they isolate the viewer one from another. How do you get a shared experience? You can certainly start seeing each other. You know, we're doing projects where we have multiple users in the same environment, but all in, in separate Oculus Rifts. But it's very different than going into a cinema and with 300 people or 500 people or 100 people um, and actually sharing the experience together. So I think that at some point I have a feeling that VR is going to hit that wall kind of as it did the first time around, which is, which is you know, do you really want to lock yourself inside a, a, you know, this box around your head? 
uh, but it gives incredibly compelling experiences, and I think there's no denying that it's kind of addictive once you're inside VR. So uh, that's the balance. But I, I'm kind of looking at wearables as well and like what happens when your glasses are really giving you a high resolution image. How do you get rid of some of this hardware and actually get into, well, ultimately, I guess we'll just plug in and it'll be the matrix. Yeah. All right. Sorry. I was going to ask about video gaming and how this related to video gaming generally is the, in the sense of, you know, the video gamer creating his world, especially with Minecraft or something like that. But um, I think that that was a better question, really. <laughs> but I, I did want to mention, you know, a client of our firm who's done interesting things is coming at it from a book publishing novelist um, point of view is Cornelia Funk. Mm. who did the um, Ink Heart uh, trilogy, wrote a lot of books that have fantasy elements and developed an iPad, um, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, application for one of her last books um, along with a visual effects company, which was very interesting. I don't think it really got the attention, but it was an attempt to come at the same idea, but from writing a book. I'm writing a book, I'm creating a world, how do I allow my readers to go deeper into the world. And it is a merger of film and book, which is just the same, creating a world. Yeah, I agree. I think Cordelia Funk's doing amazing work. And I think um, that the future of the book is, is, is a whole area in itself. You know, I think the e-book is a pretty unsatisfying experience right now. It's just a bad simulacrum of the page turning that we love to do with real books. But, but the idea that, for example, you could engage with a, a, a well-known story and, and pull characters off the screen, I, I'm, I'm quite interested in augmented reality, especially in that space, where you can, you know, we know now with a tablet that you can map the space, you can just swing your tablet around at home and it knows where it is, it knows how big the space is, it knows where your shelves are. You could pull a character off the page and put it on your shelf and have it live there. I think you can have a different experience now with the characters of books, particularly in children's books, I think it's really an interesting space. And I think, again, we have to kind of look beyond what we think an electronic book is now and think about what it could be when all these tools are really widely available to us. Okay. I'm sorry, I have to let Alex go. Okay. I was uh, just going to say one thing, though, that uh, for, as a lawyer, ownership of these worlds is very difficult, like, because the idea of the book writer was that this is their world and these ideas and they originated it. Yeah. Isn't that an interesting question? We have, when I build a world with my students, I have, right now we're building a world called Relau, which is a city, a fictional city. We have about 80 students around the world working in this space right now. Everybody is contributing and participatory in the way that that world evolves and the stories that evolve from it. There is no possibility of IP in that space, which I personally find delightful. And I applaud that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.